Well, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Liz Toth. I'm the Director of Alumni Relations here at Dickinson College, and I'm so glad all of you could join us today. Uh, we're here today to hear from Professor Maggie Douglas, who is a Professor of Environmental Science at Dickinson. She has studied ecology and agricultural sy uh, systems with an emphasis on the role of insects and other invertebrates, and is here today to tell us what we are in for as brood X starts showing up on the East Coast. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Maggie. Um, she will present and we'll have time for questions at the end. As you have questions throughout the presentation or at the end, please try to use the Q&A box, but we'll keep an eye on both Q&A and chat. So thank you very much. Maggie, all you. Okay, excellent. Thanks so much, Liz. And um, good afternoon, everybody. And um, thank you so much for spending a little bit of your Monday learning about brood 10 and these cicadas that are about to be um, joining us here in the eastern United States. Um, I thought just to kind of get started and help me understand who's with us today, um, if you see the chat option, which um, I think you can see as a box either at the bottom or at the top of your screen, um, you can go ahead and share where you're joining from and also what brings you to the talk today. Um, and as you share that, um, I'll go ahead and kind of get started, get moving here. Um, and I have to say, as an entomologist, it, there is almost nothing as exciting as a periodical cicada emergence. So I'm really excited to um, share this with you all today. Okay, so one thing I wanted to just start out and make sure everybody knows um, is that periodical cicadas are a unique phenomenon um, to this part of the world. So, um, you know, often when people think about wildlife, you might think about something like an elephant or a tiger or a rhinoceros, something really exotic, something that occurs far away, maybe in the African savanna or something like this. Um, but periodical cicadas, one cool thing about them is that they only occur in the eastern United States. This is the only place in the world where you can see these things. Um, and it really is, in my opinion, one of the most amazing kind of natural phenomena that we get to observe. So my hope today and my goal is to give you a guided tour of what you're going to see and hear over the next uh, month or so, a couple months, um, as Brood 10 emerges. And it's great to see everybody um, kind of sharing in the chat there. So it looks like we've got people from throughout the range, which is, which is great. And very cool to see we've got an environmental science teacher joining us um, that has been monitoring soil temperatures. So we'll touch on that um, in just a little bit here. So that's great. Okay, so um, to begin with, I thought we would start by just making sure everybody understands what is a cicada anyways. Um, so if we look at the insect family tree, and of course there's a huge diversity of insects in the world, um, cicadas fall on a part of that family tree that entomologists call the true bugs. So if you want to really impress your friends, um, you can tell them that cicadas are true bugs. This makes them relatives of things like stink bugs, or if you're a gardener, you might be familiar with aphids that sometimes feed on your plants. Um, cicadas are kind of related to those other insects. And one thing that the members of this group all kind of share and have in common, here you see kind of a close up of a cicada and this pointy thing sticking out in the middle is actually its mouth. That's what the cicada uses to feed. And all true bugs have this kind of pointy beak like mouth that they use to feed on whatever it is that they feed upon. Okay, and um, there are actually a huge diversity of cicadas that occur around the world. There are about 3000 species worldwide, um, but most of these cicadas are not periodical cicadas. They're what we call annual cicadas. And I'll explain in a minute what that means. So within that 3000 species of cicadas that are found worldwide, and you can see some examples over here on the right, many of them are quite beautiful and quite striking. There are seven species only, which are what we call periodical cicadas. And three of those species have a 17 year life cycle and four of those species have a 14 year life cycle. So these are the cicadas that take a really, really long time to complete their development. Um, probably many of you, so, so these annual cicadas, the ones that are more common and found all over the world, 
um, are what we call annual cicadas, which means that um, they are present pretty much every year. Um, you are probably familiar with these. You've probably seen these before. Um, in our region, this is one of the species that is quite common. Um, they tend to be a little bit larger. Um, most individuals live for about two to four years, but there are um, adults present in any given year. And they emerge later in the summer, right? So they emerge more kind of July through September. And that's one reason why they're sometimes called the dog day cicadas because they tend to be abundant during those kind of dog days of summer. Um, on the other hand, periodical cicadas um, look quite different. They're quite easy to distinguish from these annual cicadas. Um, they're mostly black. They have these reddish orangish kind of eyes and wing veins. And all of these periodical cicadas live for either 13 years or 17 years. So um, there are different species and the species vary in how long they take to complete their life cycle, but they all live for either 13 or 17 years. And they emerge earlier in the summer, right? So we're getting ready for brood 10 to emerge. They're gonna be emerging um, during May and perhaps into early June and that's about it. Okay. And great to see a few, few more folks joining us here and uh, a few with memories of earlier cicada emergences. So that's one of the things I'm curious about who has experienced this before. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about um, what periodical cicadas are. So there are these cicadas that take, you know, 13 or 17 years to complete their life cycle. Um, and then you might be wondering, what is a brood? What is all this talk about broods? Well, um, all the cicadas, that emerge together in a particular year and region are called a brood, right? This is one way that entomologists, people who study insects, kind of keep track of these different cicadas. And each brood, um, it turns out, actually contains multiple species. So a given brood will contain either all the 13-year cicadas or all the 17-year cicada species. All right, in this case for brood 10, um, this is a 17 year uh, brood. And so it's gonna contain the three 17 year cicada species. Um, one thing that's just interesting to think about if you're a person who likes math is that the 13 and 17 year species will coincide every once in a while, but that only happens about once every 221 years. So um, that would be a pretty cool event. And maybe sometime in my lifetime, I haven't checked it out to see when the next one is likely to occur, but um, that would be a neat thing to observe. And another thing you can notice, so this map is showing you the different broods and you can see there are um, a, a larger number of 17 year broods and then three 13 year broods. And um, one kind of interesting thing about them is you can see how they're distributed here across the country. And it turns out that um, the broods don't overlap too much geographically. So they kind of fit together almost like puzzle pieces um, where you know, a given brood is found in a particular area and then other broods are kind of in a different area. So that's just one kind of interesting thing. And it turns out that scientists are not entirely sure why that is the case, but um, it has been kind of consistently observed. All right, so what is going on with brood, egg, brood 10? Um, and it is, it's a Roman numeral. So we would say brood 10 is the name of this particular brood. Um, and so, you know, in any given year, some periodical cicada is emerging somewhere, right? But some of the broods are bigger than others. Brood 10 is very, very large. It's a really large brood and it's the most widely distributed of all the broods. Okay, so it's gonna occur in across 15 states you know, Georgia, all the way up to New York State, Eastern Seaboard across um, to the Mississippi, right? So you're gonna find it in this really large area. And it's also really large in terms of the number of insects that are present and are expected. So we're expecting there's gonna be around um, one and a half million bugs per acre. All right, this is a lot of cicadas. So it's a really, really impressive um, just in terms of sheer numbers. And that's one of the reasons why brood 10 gets so much attention. Um, and as I mentioned to you before, so in this brood, like in all broods, there are actually multiple species present. So these are the three species of 17 year cicadas um, that are gonna be emerging in this brood. And these will kind of um, co-occur in the areas where the brood is emerging. So when you're looking around in your yard, you see cicadas start to emerge, they could be any one of these three species, actually. 
Okay, so next, I want to talk you through the cicada life cycle, which is going to um, help you understand what it is that we're all about to observe and experience. All right, so um, what's happening right now? Well, the cicadas that are getting ready to emerge, they are basically teenagers. Um, they're in a life stage of cicadas that we call a nymph, okay? And they are 17 years old. So, um, you know, it's interesting to me to think about these cicadas that are emerging now are about the same age as many of the college students that I teach, right? They've been on earth for the same amount of time. And um, this picture over on the right, this is actually um, a cicada that my nephew Teddy found when he was digging around in his yard. And they sent me this video wondering what it is. And perhaps if some of you are gardeners or you've been out doing yard work, you might have seen something like this as well. But this is that teenage cicada that's been living underground and developing for 17 years and is now getting ready to emerge. Um, and how do they know, you know, when it's time to actually come out? Well, that seems to be mostly controlled by soil temperature. Um, and so 64 degrees Fahrenheit seems to be the magic number. When the soil reaches that temperature, um, then the cicadas will emerge. It also often occurs um, shortly after like a soaking rain event. Um, and so this is another kind of sign that you can look for over the coming uh, weeks is that you'll start to see these junior cicadas, these teenage cicadas building these tunnels as they get ready to emerge from the ground. So you'll see these big holes um, and depending on the type of soil and things like that, they can look a little bit different, but um, they will start to kind of excavate those holes as they get ready to come out. Whoops. Okay. And so after they emerge, then what happens next? Well, um, these cicadas, so, you know, they're still the teenagers at this point. Um, when they emerge, they start looking for vertical surfaces to climb. And, um, you know, that could be a tree, it could be a shrub, it e might even be, you know, a person if you're standing nearby. Um, but what they're doing is they're going to climb up that vertical surface and then they're going to get ready to do what's called molting. So remember that insects, because their skeleton is on the outside of their body, in order to grow, they have to actually shed that skeleton and climb out and then create a new skeleton. And so um, this, these teenagers, when they come out, they kind of latch on to these vertical surfaces and then the adults actually climb out of the old skin. And then um, it takes a little bit of time for these adult cicadas to fully harden up their bodies. Um, and they actually pump insect blood um, through to help expand their wings and things like this. Um, but it takes a little bit of time for them to fully harden. So this is one thing you can expect to see. Um, you probably are going to see a lot of these cast off uh, molts or kind of old skeletons that are hanging around. Um, if you see it split up the backside, that's probably a good sign that that's what you're looking at. Okay, and then, you know, the next thing that's going to happen is that then the cicadas are looking for love, right? So um, the adults, they only live for several weeks, maybe about a month. And their main goal during that time is to find a mate. Um, the adults are doing little to no eating, um, but they're really focusing their energy on, you know, finding a suitable mate and trying to make the next generation of cicadas. And this is a good time to bring up the sound, right? So um, one of the things that is most kind of noticeable about the cicadas is the really incredible sound that they make. And that sound um, has several different functions actually, but one of the main functions is um, that it's involved in mating. Um, and so if you look at a cicada, a male cicada, so only the males sing actually, um, and on the side of their body, they have these structures called a timbal. This is not the greatest image, it's a little bit blurry, but um, this is basically a structure on the side of their body and this is showing you kind of if you were to cut their body in half, you can see that there's muscles that connect to it. And when they contract those muscles, this is basically like the head of a drum and it vibrates. And that vibration is what creates the sound. It can be extremely loud, it can be up to a hundred decibels, really, really loud, which is one reason why I don't recommend holding a cicada up to your ear because you can actually do some damage to your ear by doing that. 
Um, and as I mentioned, only the males are singing and each species has its own unique song. Um, here's just another image so you can get an idea of what this looks like. So this is showing the cicada's body and this part around the middle that looks like it has sort of ridges, that's the timbal. So that's the sound producing organ. And then down at the bottom, there's this other thing called a tympanum, which is actually the cicada's ear. So that's how cicadas hear one another when they're making these sounds. And so both the males and the females have a tympanum, but only the males have the timbal. Um, and I wanted to actually stop for a moment, stop sharing for a moment and see if I can play for you some examples of these songs so that you um, know what they will sound like. So here is the chorus of one of the species that we're gonna hear. And then here's one of the other species. And then here's the final species chorus. And these sounds that I've played for you so far, um, these are what we call the chorus. These are the sounds that the males make and they actually, um, they aggregate together as they make those sounds and they create um, in particular trees, they kind of group together to have a cicada party that attracts the females to come and mate. Um, but they also have slightly different songs that they sing sometimes that are, um, you know, once they've attracted females to the, to the area, um, to kind of communicate between particular cicadas. And so they have these other courtship songs. Here's one. And so you can hear how the courtship song can sound um, pretty different actually from the general kind of chorus. But there's um, a whole kind of cicada vocabulary. There are different ways that they communicate with one another for different reasons. Um, and it's even thought that some of their songs have more to do with um, scaring away predators and things like that, which we'll get to in a moment. Oh, I love the cicada dating. Yeah, cicada dating is a good way to put it. Okay, so after they've mated, um, the next thing that happens is that the females are going to lay their eggs. Um, and so here's a picture of the female what she's looking for, she's actually laying her eggs on um, tree twigs. So these are twigs about a quarter inch across or so. And um, she's going to lay those into the twigs. And then as you can see over here on the right, the eggs actually develop inside of the twigs. Um, and they spend about six to eight weeks inside the twig before they hatch. And one interesting thing, so the eggs are, had, are laid up in the twigs, and then when they hatch out, um, the baby cicadas we call nymphs, and those nymphs drop to the soil and then burrow under the ground. So here you can see um, what the kind of really young nymphs look like. So you can see they're really, really tiny when they first hatch out. These are the guys that are going to drop to the ground, and then they kind of tunnel into the soil. And then really they're finding the spot where they're going to stay and develop for the next 17 years. Um, so, you know, they better be, uh, find a spot that they like. Um, so you can see over here on the right, these are the different growth stages that these um, immature cicadas go through. So they have five what are called instars. So just like I was telling you before that in order to grow, insects need to shed their skeleton. Um, so you have these really tiny kind of baby nymphs. Um, once they start growing, they eventually become a second instar then they shed that skeleton and become a third instar and so on and so forth. And it takes them 17 years in this case um, to get through all of these parts of the cycle until this fifth instar, which is where they are now getting ready to emerge. Okay, so one of the questions that people often have um, when they learn about periodical cicadas is, you know, why do they stay underground for so long? It seems really surprising. And the leading hypothesis, the reason why scientists believe that they do this is basically safety in numbers. 
Um, the kind of fancy way to say this in scientific terminology is predator satiation. What this means is that um, so many cicadas emerge at the same time that the predators just can't even eat them all. It's kind of like an all you can eat buffet of cicadas. So, um, you know, because the predators can't physically eat them all, that leaves other cicadas that are able to breed and mate and reproduce, right? So it keeps the species going. So um, probably the really extreme life cycle staying underground for 13 or 17 years has to do with avoiding predators. And this is important because cicadas have a lot of different predators. Um, and this is something that we'll probably get to a chance to observe as well. Um, so you can see everything from like lots of different kinds of birds like to eat them. Um, there are many small mammals, um, chipmunks and such that will eat them. Um, your cat or dog might even like to eat them. Um, and even spiders and some other insects will attack them. Um, and cicadas, you can imagine these periodical emergences are so big that sometimes you can see a signal, kind of a bump in these other species that occurs because of the cicada emergence year. So sometimes birds will lay extra eggs or have extra clutches. Um, and so you'll actually see kind of a bump in these predators occurring after the cicadas emerge. Um, if you're feeling really adventurous, you could even try to eat a cicada yourself. Um, there are some recipes out there. There's a cookbook called Cicadalicious that you can um, Google and find pretty easily um, if you are feeling like you wanna explore cicada cuisine. Okay, and so, you know, this 13 and 17 year life cycle allows the cicadas to um, avoid getting clobbered by a lot of their predators, but there, there is one cicada enemy that has kind of evolved to crack the code a little bit. And this is really, really fascinating. It's a fungus. Um, and so this is a fungus. This is kind of a complicated diagram, I know, but the basic way that this works is that the fungus um, there are spores in the so soil. And so when these nymphs emerge from the soil, they can pick up some of those spores and be infected by the fungus. Um, then that becomes an adult, which is then also infected. Um, and then these infected cicadas, they actually um, go on to mate with other cicadas and pass the fungus that way. So in a way, this fungus is almost like a sexually transmitted disease. Um, and you'll see signs of this if you're looking around in your area when the cicadas emerge, um, you can tell because you'll see these cicadas have this kind of fungal infection that is actually becomes quite obvious over time. And then eventually, you know, the fungus creates more spores, which then are deposited back on the soil and kind of are ready to infect the next generation. And those fungal spores can live for a really, really long time. Okay, so one thing that when people learn that cicadas are feeding on tree roots, um, they start to worry that the cicadas might hurt their trees. Um, and you might see some cosmetic damage um, after the cicada emergence. What you see on the left here is what's called flagging. This is actually caused by when the cicadas lay their eggs in these twigs, it can kill the tips of the branches of those twigs off. Um, this turns out for most mature trees, this is really not a problem. In fact, the cicadas might be doing you a favor by kind of pruning biologically your tree. Um, but if you have, you know, the cases where you can see damage done by cicadas are usually really young trees that have just been planted kind of a thing. Um, and if you have any real young trees or shrubs and you expect to be in a really heavy area or when you start, when they start to emerge, if you see that you're in a really heavy area, you can consider protecting the tree just with um, bird netting is one effective way to keep them from laying the eggs there. Um, the feeding below ground is typically very slow. And so it usually does not stress a tree too badly or um, in a way that's gonna harm the tree. Um, so that's usually less of a concern. Usually this, um, when there is damage, it's usually associated by the egg laying, but even that is fairly rare. Um, and it's also worth pointing out that um, cicadas might actually have some positive effects on plants in the area as well. You can imagine when this, after this huge emergence, the adults, um, they die and they become kind of a rain of cicada fertilizer, right? So you can see over here on the right, all this kind of layer of cicadas um, which as they kind of decompose are gonna provide nutrients to the plants that are nearby. 
Um, this was an interesting graph from a study showing in an area that um, plants that had cicada, you know, this kind of death, you know, reign of cicada death um, actually had more nitrogen, which is an important plant nutrient in their leaves. Um, and they, the plants also grew bigger because of this kind of pulse of nutrients that the cicadas provided. Um, and also, you know, if you remember that the cicadas are digging these big holes as they emerge, um, those holes help to bring air and water down into the soil, which also can um, benefit the roots of some plants. So overall, the effects of the cicadas are somewhat mixed for the plants, but some plants are gonna, might actually benefit. Okay, so um, that's all about the kind of main information I wanted to share with you today. Um, I'm so glad that you all are excited about the cicadas. If you'd like to become a cicada community scientist, there's an interesting project called Cicada Safari and an associated um, smartphone app that you can download and you can help map the cicadas and help scientists understand their distributions. Um, and there's also a couple of cicada related hashtags if you wanna um, share your observations and photos of the cicadas as you see them. Um, just last week, Brood 10 started emerging in Tennessee. So it's already begun and I expect it will be with us soon. Um, so at this point, I'm gonna stop talking and I'd be happy to um, take a few questions with the time that we have left. Thank you, Maggie. Um, that was wonderful, though. I'm, not, I'm sure I could have lived without knowing that there's a cookbook for cicadas, but you know, the more you know. Uh, we do have some questions coming in. Um, our first question is, um, does brood 10 make the same sound every 17 years? Oh, great question. So um, one thing I would say is, so remember that brood 10 has three different species that make it up. And each of those species has a unique call or or song and so i do believe that the song would be consistent you know over time so like the the cicadas of the same species when they emerged 17 years ago probably made the same sound that they're about to make now as they emerge so yes i do believe that the sound um, the songs that they make are consistent from one you know emergence to the next within the same species right but then the species have distinct sounds and the different sounds of the different species is actually really important because that's how cicadas make sure they're mating with the right species, the right partners, right? That's how they find their mates. So you can imagine it's very noisy. There's a lot of different cicadas all around. Um, so having that kind of species specific song helps them be able to find each other at the dance, so to speak. Oh, well, that's great. Um, how big are cicadas? How big are they? Yeah. So. I mean, we're all going to find out <laughs> pretty, soon, pretty soon here, but they're, you know, as insects go, they're really, they're pretty large. Um, the periodical cicadas are a little bit smaller than the annual cicadas. So like the annual cicadas that you see, I would say are probably about two inches and the periodical cicadas are a little bit smaller than that. Um, but, you know, they're maybe around the size of a quarter or a little bit bigger, right? So um, these are substantial insects and that's one of the reasons why um, they have such a tremendous impact on the ecosystem of which they are part because they're this amazing mechanism for transferring energy um, and material through the ecosystem as they go from below ground to above ground. Wow. Yeah, big questions. Um, do you suppose that the wildlife predators, the rabbits, squirrels, and birds will be really prolific during the next year due to the increased calorie consumption of cicadas? Yeah, that's a great question. And I was looking into that a little bit um, in preparation for this talk because I had a similar question. I was curious about that. And it turns out, you know, from past emergences, there the patterns are somewhat mixed. So there are some groups, you know, species of wildlife that seem to show um, increased population like the year after the cicadas emerge, which I think the question is kind of suggesting. Um, but not always. It's a little bit mixed. So some species do show that pattern and others don't. And you can imagine from the perspective of these predators, you know, this is part of the whole theory behind the 17 year and 13 year thing is that, you know, it prevents any of these predator populations from becoming really synchronized with the cicadas. So there's only so much that these other kind of wildlife populations can benefit from it. 
And then it also kind of sets them up a little bit for failure, right? Because if they gorge themselves this year, create huge populations, then next year, there's not gonna be such a cicada feast, right? So sometimes you see kind of unusually large populations for a year, but then you also see them crash the following year because there isn't as much food available. Great question. Um, will all three of the subspecies come out at the same time and in the same places? Yeah, good question. So as far as the places are concerned, it's actually kind of interesting. If you look in um, a natural forest, like an undisturbed forest, you tend to see that the three species are found in a little bit different places. They have slightly different preferences when it comes to the types of trees that they like to feed upon. Um, but when you look at more human dominated places, um, you tend to see them all in the same places. And that, you know, the human kind of changes to the landscape has really changed the way that a cicada sees those places. Um, and it also seems to have had the effect of kind of pushing the three species into the same habitats. So if you're in a suburban area or in an urban area, um, you're likely to encounter all three of them, um, but probably not in the same amounts. Some of them tend to be more abundant than others. Um, so there is a little bit of variability there, but it, you could possibly encounter all three of them. Um, the other part of the question about whether they will all emerge at the same time, you know, I have to admit, I'm actually not entirely sure about that because um, they do, at least within a species, they tend to be remarkably synchronous, like it, within the course of a day, you know, they're all emerging. So it's really pretty incredible how, how synced up they are. Um, and I believe that that is also true across the species, but I'm less confident about that. So that would actually be an interesting thing to observe, you know, as you are kind of noticing what's going on around you is to kind of pay attention to that and see if you can notice um, any variability there. But um, it's a really good and interesting question. But part of the, the, again, going back to this kind of predator hypothesis, the only way that really works is if they're all coming out at once. Right, because that then they overwhelm the predators and they're not able to eat, eat them all up, right? Um, so I do think it's likely that they're gonna be pretty tight together. We have two more questions. Um, when is the next 13 year emergence? Because hopefully it's not next year. <laughs> When's the next 13 year emergence? Yeah, let me go back, let me see. Maybe I can find, let's see if we can look at our brood map here. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure, but um, we should be able to figure it out. So if we look, so 13 year, so yeah, I think that brood we're probably not going to see that's like uh, brood 19, I think is not going to occur, at least in Pennsylvania. It's not really in our region. Um, so that makes me think Yeah, actually, so one of the things about the 13 years too is that the 13 years tend to be a little bit more Southern. The 17 years tend to be a little bit more Northern. Um, so at least here in central Pennsylvania, we mostly see the 17 year broods. We don't, you know, there are, we might see a little bit of the edge of some of these 13 years, but they're, we're not gonna see them as much. Those are more concentrated. You can see like this green one um, down here around the Mississippi more in the South. Um, and that tends to be the case generally for the 13 years for whatever reason is that they occur a little bit more to the south of the to the compared to the 17 years. Yeah, so we will, we probably should be keeping an eye more on the 17 years. And there are some other 17 year broods um, that we might come close to. Um, but this is certainly the one that we will see in the biggest numbers. I'm going to combine a couple of questions for our final question. Um, which is, so annual cicadas mostly sing late in the afternoon or evening, do periodical ones sing all day? And if someone has say two acres and you're estimating that means 3 million cicadas for that person, how loud is this going to be? <laughs> <laughs> um, wow, some of those are, these are like advanced questions. I think we have to give like a cicada, you know, upper level advanced <laughs> up here. Um, but, well, they're Dickinsonians. Yeah, well, they, yeah, that's right. That's right. But, um, you know, as far as the time of day is concerned, they, so yeah, my understanding is that the, they do sing, they do sometimes sing kind of continuously over several days. And part of this is related to, again, like the different songs. So the chorusing 
is about sort of them aggregating into kind of a mating group. And that can occur, I believe can occur continuously, you know, over several days or something like this for a particular group of cicadas. Um, then there may be specific, um, you know, mating calls and things like that, other songs that occur in a more limited way. But I think you can often hear kind of, you know, over time, not, not confined just to particular time. Um, and then as far as the sound, um, I mean, you know, so sound, it, it, it partly is gonna depend on how close you are to them, right? And things like that. Um, I guess I would just say, I'm gonna default here to the just really loud. <laughs> they're, gonna be, they're gonna be really loud. Um, I don't know that I can give you like a scientific kind of estimate, but, um, but yeah, it is good to keep in mind that the, so cicadas, they don't bite and they don't sting, right? So they're not gonna hurt people. And you, know, you don't have to be worried about like, if you pick one up, it's probably gonna be fine. Um, but as I mentioned, the thing you don't wanna do is hold it up to your ear because um, they are loud enough that you can do some damage that way. So um, keep a safe distance, I would say, <laughs> from them. Well, thank you very much, Maggie. Um, someone has just shared a, a fun podcast episode with the group in the chat. Um, so that's there for people who, who would like to learn even more. And thank you very much for that, Paige. Um, and thank you, Maggie, for joining us today and teaching, teaching us about what is to come. And we'll all find this out together. So <laughs> that's great. And enjoy the emergence, everyone. Thanks. For yes. And thank you to all of you for joining us today. And I hope we'll see you at another one of our programs very soon. Have a good rest of your day.